Again, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm thankful to be here with you and uh, excited to uh, go through the scriptures here. So if you can, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 9. Um, we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage. Actually, it was uh, the, one of the verses was in the announcements and uh, the song, Shout to the Lord. You know, it's a very uh, near and dear to my heart song, if you will. Um, I remember being in Wales on a mission trip uh, with my then uh, girlfriend. Um, and, you know, we were, I, I was very young in the Lord. She had been following the Lord um, in junior high, since junior high. And we were there. It was our first mission trip together. And, you know, we're like, still trying to figure out like where we stand with everything. But I remember um, going to a Pentecostal uh, tent uh, revival that they were having in Wales to celebrate. I think it was the 100th year of the Welsh revival. And we were there um, helping with Creation Fest, which is um, another festival that's in South London and, or South England. And um, I remember that song specifically, Shout to the Lord. And you know, I'm like old school, like, you know, Michael W. Smith song or whatever, you know, all these songs that were like old school, like, you know, well, old school is like 90s, 80s, whatever, you know. To me, I was like, that's like the old school, you know, and I was just like, it was so powerful because the Holy Spirit felt, felt so powerfully on that tent. And people were speaking. This is my first, I think I got saved like nine months ago, right? It's my first time experiencing this. And I looked to my brother Mike. I was just like, bro, what's happening? He's like, and Lord, I pray you fill Hector with the Spirit. And I was just like, oh, man, let's hold on. This is like a roller coaster, you know? Because I had no idea what was going on. I had heard about it in the book of Acts, but I hadn't seen it. And man, to see the Holy Spirit fall in that place was very special. To this day, that song immediately teleports me to that place in that tent. It was on the pier, so it was like a boardwalk, you know, the wooden planks. And man, it was powerful. And, and the text that we're in tonight is powerful. And I want us to begin uh, by closing our eyes, okay? Don't worry, I'm not going to make faces at you or anything. But I need you to ask yourself something. I need you to ask yourself this. Who do you believe is the greatest leader that's ever walked the face of the earth? What qualities come to mind when you think of that great leader? Why is he or she such a great leader? And how has his or her life and vision changed your life? Now open your eyes. If you're still thinking about that person, I want you to ask yourself this. Do you define greatness by what they did? Did you define greatness by what they maybe created? Or did you define greatness by how that person has impacted you personally? Marquette University did a study on leadership. And they said these are the five greatest characteristics of great leadership. Number one, communication. So how the leader communicates with his team, or with his subordinates, whoever that may be. Number two, his decision-making skills. Right? How, how they come to a conclusion and then, and then put forth a plan. Right? They make a decision and then map it out. Number three, their integrity who they are when no one else is looking. Trust, how they gain their trust, how they maintain trust. And number five, empathy, 
how they relate to others and how they show they care and understand a situation. Sounds smart, right? Like, sounds pretty cool. Like, I think we could take this plan and be like, all right, everybody, take it to work and see, like, I want, if you want to be a great leader, here are five things that you can invest in right here, right now, okay? Let's, let, let's start working on how people trust you. Can you gain their trust? Can you be empathetic? Can you make good decisions, right? Can you communicate well? And that sounds all great and awesome. Those are great things that a leader can do. But I believe there's a leader that lived a life where these five things were not just executed flawlessly. He went above and beyond. Like calling this person a great leader, it's like almost dumbing him down to the world standards. This leader who not only blew these five characteristics away, also did something greater. So let's set the scene. First nine chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. Don't worry, we'll pray in a second. According to Matthew, we see Jesus performing miracle after miracle. So I'm going to sum up the first nine chapters here for you. He was teaching his disciples how to pray, right? teaching them how to make decisions on the fly, how to communicate. He was communicating to the disciples his plan and how to implement it, showing them what the kingdom of heaven is like, making decisions before their very eyes that no other leader had the capacity to to do and make and implement right there and then and there, gaining their trust And also hurting when others hurt. Showing empathy when it was needed. Showing compassion. And showing that he ultimately loved people. In the latter part of chapter 9, we're going to see Jesus start shifting the way he does things. A Jesus that still does the unthinkable, but begins to do something a little bit different. We're going to see him set precedence for something that he defined six, you know, what we call it, 2,000 years ago, right? He defined this 2,000 years ago, and then these universities are just starting to get the drift of what it's like to be a great leader. So let's turn to the end of chapter 9 in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be reading uh, from the New King James Version. It says this, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. We thank you, Lord, that the rocks do shout your praise. This creation just 
points to how beautiful and great and marvelous you are. Thank you, Lord, for being like no other deity on this earth. Thank you for separating yourself and being the greatest king to ever walk this planet as a servant. Lord, we come to you and we ask for Pastor Thomas that you would bring relief. We ask, God, for you to send the comforter to the Haupt family. They would know that you are there, that you are present. Father, we just ask here and now in this place that you would fill it with your spirit. You would guide us through this text, encourage us in this text through your words, Lord. And that we would glean and be changed and moved to action because of the precedence that you set, the example that you set, Lord, for us. Help me teach and preach in a way, God, that's faithful to you and to your church. In your holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Verse 35, we see Jesus is continuing to parallel everything that was ever said about Messiah. He's continuing to check off all the requirements, as if you will. You know, from a, from a kid, that's what his goal was, right? Number one is to remain sinless and spotless so that when Pilate and all the, the rulers would inspect him, they would find no spot in him. And here he is continuing to check off every requirement for Messiah, continuing to prove to a lost and dying world that he had come to seek and save the lost. And as he went through the cities and the villages, he continued to teach in the synagogues. Up to this point, many in the synagogues, um, they were like, this guy has some Messiah-like qualities. He's doing some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, many had heard him make some very bold statements pertaining to the kingdom. And it says here in verse 35 that he was preaching a specific message. He was preaching the gospel or the evangelio or the good news, right, of the kingdom. And as he did so, some opposed him, right? That, that was a, the equal and opposite reaction is that as he preached, they opposed, they pushed back. Some questioned his authoritative sayings. But it was funny to me that they continued to allow him to preach in the synagogue. Remember like when he goes and he takes the scroll of Isaiah, like just so happens he gets the scroll of Isaiah, that's what they give him that day, and then he starts reading it, and he's like, today, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your very eyes. It's like they opposed him, but they let him teach. As we look at the book of Acts, we see this practice continue. Not only did they gather in homes, but they also went into the synagogues to preach the gospel. Remember that certain disciple we talked about last time I was here? Ananias, right? He goes and he's scared, man. He's like, man, I don't know how I'm going to tell this dude Saul that God has a plan for his life. And God's like, man, you got to go tell him because he's a chosen vessel of mine. He's like, God, this guy's crazy, man. He's killing people, taking him to Jerusalem, bound. He's like, dude, look, I have a plan for this guy. I love him, and I'm going to change his life. And then Ananias goes, and he's like, hey, man, so God kind of told me that he's got a plan for you. I know you've been killing his people and everything, and yeah, I want to take you out to the back, but, but he has a plan for you, Right? And Saul spent some time in Damascus. Remember, he was blind for a few days. And then after, you know, Ananias comes in, like he scales fall off his eyes. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I've encountered the living God. Right. 
And then he stays in Damascus for a little bit. And then we pick it up in, verse, in Acts chapter 9. I just want to show you three examples here. It's Acts chapter 9, verse 20. It says, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues. And he preached that Jesus was the Son of God. Right? Later on in Acts chapter 17, verse 17, he says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. See, again, there's some continuity there, right? Acts chapter 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. For three months he spoke reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. The teaching of God's word in the synagogues is just one of the examples of the great continuity we find in the life of Jesus and the transition into the early church. Like we see Jesus doing something, right? And then that, that, that practice begins to translate into action in the early church. They begin to do what Jesus did. Isn't that crazy? Right? It shouldn't be crazy. It should be what we do every single day, right? The things that Jesus did, let's do that. And this is what the church was doing. Continuity. Uh, you know when I first you know, heard that word? I was working for Apple. And they were starting this project and this study, right? Everything's so calculated at Apple, by the way. And they're like, how do we go from if you're texting on your phone and then your computer's right there and you could seamlessly transfer it and you could, whatever you started here, you can continue here, right? And then if you introduce your iPad, whatever you did on your phone that you started on your phone and then went to the, to the MacBook and then the iPad was introduced, it, it all flowed together. It was called continuity, right? That's just what Jesus did. That's just what Jesus did. He showed the people how to love and the people loved. He showed the people how to communicate God, his own mercy and love and grace because they felt it, right? They saw it. They're like, we've never heard a guy come to us and, and forgive us for our sins. We never heard someone, like, the guy called me Satan, Peter, right? And then next thing you know, he restores me, and I preach, and 3,000 people get saved. Jesus said, check out, like, I love, like, and I'm, I'm geeking out here, right, when it comes to the scriptures. But, like, these, like, little, uh, like, you know, we call them threads in social media or whatever. Like, you just, one after the other, right? Check this out. Jesus, in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. We've all heard that, right? And he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, what did the disciples do? They followed suit because they knew that they had been loved by God. They then made love a chief characteristic of their faith. Right? And what happened? 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, right, we also ought to love one another. See, again, it's the continuity is happening. Jesus said it, the disciples believed it, and then they act on it. Right? Why is love one, why is love so important? Well, I'm glad you asked. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all things, he says. Have fervent love for one another. Why? For love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Right? That's what Jesus did for us. It seems to me that throughout the New Testament, we had some people that were so sold out on the gospel as that they took Jesus' words and believed it and bet on it. Like, do you believe something so much that you are willing to put your paycheck on it? Do you believe something so much you're willing to go to work for it? You're willing to, like, actually apply it, like, say, man, look, I know that if I do thus and so, this will happen. I know that if I, 
Um, that if I talk to my kids about Jesus and I pour into them, they're not going to stray far from the gospel. I know that if I pray for my parents and my family, they're going to get closer to God. I know that if I do these things, this will happen because we see it. We see it all through Scripture. I believe that Pastor Bill believed that God was working so much that he was willing to work multiple jobs to preach the gospel on a Sunday. I believe that the Majalas are willing to set aside some time on a Saturday to see some people get saved. I'm willing to, to bet and put money on the Hans as they pray for people. You should see them pray. You don't want them to stop. I'm willing to put money on Danielle and Teresa that they know that there's going to be fruit from these kids. In fact, because Danielle's part of that fruit. People like Stephen Carroll who changed their whole life, their whole scenery to go minister and share the love of God with kids in Mexico. Who else? I got to hear Pastor Kendall and Miss Virginia's story um, at the heart to heart thing. And the fact that they were on an island with a newborn for the gospel. I'm willing to put money that they were trusting God in those times. Friends, do we see the word of God as a check to be cashed in faith? Like, I believe this so much. I believe that God can change people's lives so much that I'm going to go and share this word with people. Do we believe in the gospel, that it is powerful and able to pierce through bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Friends, I believe that sometimes we get distracted. We get distracted with the shiny things of life. We may have forgotten how great a calling we have as believers in Christ. We may have lost our reach of that upward call in Christ. Our vision sometimes is crowded by stuff, things, events. And sometimes we strive so hard to please people that we don't even like. There are many today that look at the church as a lost cause. And the reason why I say that is because I'm surrounded by them. Not here, of course, but at work. People that think I'm weird. <laughs> but when your, your vice president gets up to give you an award and he starts to tell people that you're an ordained pastor and that God is using you. And then he says, would you pray for us? What do you do? Do you sit there and complain? Oh, man, the rates are too high. Ain't nobody want a second mortgage right now. Oh, man. You know, and you start to make all these excuses in your head. And God just is like, hey, just open here. Okay, read this real quick. All right, now you're ready. Now you have the right attitude. Now you have the right mindset. Now your heart is correct. Now you, you're not going to complain. You're going to go to work. You're going to put in the hours. You're going to outwork everybody. You're going to outhustle everybody. And guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what this fruit thing is all about. Sometimes the world sees the church as a lost cause. 
And sometimes the church sees this generation in that exact same manner. Like, we see the, the next group of people, it's like generation, whatever, you know, all of them, the millenn- yeah, there you go, millennials, <laughs> you know, we start naming them. We already know all, the, all the, the names attached to them, right? And we're just like, they're lost, they're whatever, they don't even know how to work, they don't know what blue collar means, they just want a handout, Right? And I'm like in between, like I was born in 81, so I'm like not a millennial, but not a whatever the next thing is. I'm like, I don't know. I just like to follow Jesus. But here's, here's what we got. We got a broken generation that is made fun of because they're just like the generation that Jesus was looking at in chapter 9. They were lost, scattered like sheep without a shepherd. When we see the lost and broken generation, whether it's behind us or ahead of us, are we critical? Or are we moved with compassion? Ask yourself that question. Like you yourself, are you critical or do, you, do you have like a, you could write a full-blown essay of why they're terrible? Or are you moved with compassion? Verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. When Jesus saw the multitudes, the myriads of people wandering about, following him without a real reason, or maybe just wanting to be entertained, he was moved with compassion. That word means splank nizomai. Splank nizomai. That's the word in the Greek. And you know what it means? It's to have a deep empathy for the people, a deep concern for the people. A deep suffering and groaning within for those people. What would cause such a deep concern? Like they're lost. Just give them here. Here's my phone. Here's ways. Open them up. You know, get to where you're going. Right? What's so concerning about a lost and broken generation? They're just going to mess themselves up, right? They're so confused, they don't even know which bathroom to go in, right? So, hey, let's just figure it out for them, make it really clear, and maybe they'll figure it out. No. The cause for deep concern is because Jesus saw something great in that generation. He looks at his disciples in verse 37. He says, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That's like a, wow, bummer, you know? It's like a, oh my gosh, yes, Lord, let's save these people. But dang, we don't have enough people. As tears maybe welled up, as the burden grew deeper, as the situation looked grim, Jesus turns to his disciples and lets them in on a little secret. He's like, fellas, I know this might not make sense right now. I know they look lost and scattered and they need a shepherd. But I'm telling you, in this crowd, there is a plentiful harvest. I know they look lost. I know they just might be wanting a meal, right? We've already fed them a couple times. But I'm telling you, the fields look ripe. These people are ready to receive what I have in store for them. Where else are they going to find life like the gospel provides? Where else are they going to go? After stating this powerful truth, Jesus follows it with the problem, right? The bummer. Man, the laborers are few. And this, friends is what caused great, deep empathy in the heart of Jesus. Because he saw a potential, right? 
He saw potential. He saw the need. And, and though he was, he was going to go to the cross, right, to, to make that need like a reality, to, to be like, hey, all right, cool, you're a sinner. Now let's, let's get you saved, right? He was going to do everything for them to make everything right. And yet he was like, though I want to save them, I just, I lack the workforce, Imagine having an idea so brilliant and not having the resources to make it come to life. Church, to every pastor teaching through the Bible, they know what this verse means. See, we're dreamers, man. I dream of this sanctuary being filled. I dream of churches preaching the gospel and seeing people get saved. I dream of this lost generation coming to know who Jesus really is. I dream of that stuff. I want to see that dream come true. And every pastor that teaches through the Bible knows that, dreams that, is wanting that. They fall back on the fact that the laborers are few. What Jesus said was true. It breaks our hearts to see a lost generation go their way and not have the workforce to reach them. This reality should cause us to pray more. And that's why Jesus goes on to say, Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Think about it. He's telling these these few teenagers, he's like, Hey, man, look, you're going to need more people to accomplish what I've set out for you. Yeah, I mean, imagine like P- Peter, right? Like he's like going to preach it and 3,000 people get Imagine if each one of them were able to preach the gospel in 3,000. It would still not be enough to spread the gospel to everyone. It was only 12 of them. So he's like, not only do you go out and preach the gospel, I need you to pray that the Lord would send more people to preach the gospel. Why must we pray? As of today, the year 2023, just in this year alone, over 60 million people have stepped into eternity. By the time we get home tonight, And we lay our head down. Just today, 199,000 will step into eternity. How many of those people had an encounter with Christ? How many of those people went to church? How many of those people heard the gospel? I think the stat is that they have to hear it at least seven or eight times before they come to know the Lord. How many times did a Christian pay for their gas or buy them food or met a need and then share the gospel with them? 199,000 people. That's a lot of people in 24 hours. Church, he is telling the disciples that the harvest is plentiful because he actually believed it. He believed it so much that he went to the cross to die for our sins, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting everlasting life, right? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame, right? He put, he doubled down on what the cross meant, like we talked about a few weeks or last time I was here, what, what did he do? Every time he was tempted with sin, he had to think about the cross and would it mean something. Friends, Jesus looks to, the, to here this day and he looks at all of you and he says, the harvest is still plentiful and the laborers are still few. 
He looks at a generation without hope. And maybe he's knocking on your heart right now and saying, hey, there's a couple of tents back there that need to be put out on a park. Maybe you should take one out. Maybe he knocks on your heart and says, hey, I need you to go share with a neighbor just the Bible verse that you used, that that I spoke to you with this morning. Just go share with them. See what happens. Go tell them that God so loved the world. Friends, we are a Bible-believing church, yes? We believe in these promises, yes? We believe that his word does not return void, yes? yes. All right. Ezekiel 33:11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? Why should 199,000 people die every day without the hope in the risen Christ? Why? Because the laborers are few. It's not that God desires. It's not that the, the gospel is powerless. It's that there's no laborers. God desires that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who knew that a guy, that God was so long-suffering with, would be invited after his bar shift to go hear a message by this little white, blue-eyed girl, right? Right? And that guy is now sitting in front of you preaching the gospel. Who knew? You look at my wife. She's, she's probably was like, oh my gosh, here we go again. Let's, let me, let's, let's ask him again. All right, hey, Hector, uh, want to go to church today? It's like, you should come to church. And then she would get her drinks and walk, run away to her table, right? And I'm like, what's that about? I can go to church. And she did it again, and again, and again. And now I'm here. Friends, God's heart for lost people is that they would be saved. And if he's telling us there are people out there that actually want, need, and desire salvation, again, the problem isn't that the gospel is powerless. The problem is that there's not enough laborers. Think about it. We're not asking for white-collar people. We're not asking for executives. We're not asking for suits and ties. All we're asking is that you trust what you read every morning and say, God, maybe you want to save somebody today. For those of us who can't physically go, would you be encouraged to pray? To pray that God would send more people into the harvest. Right? To see more people out there on mission. And I'm not, friends, I'm not even talking about like, hey, we're going to, you know, like the Majalas, you know, on, on Saturday, Right? We're going to go and purposely set up some tents, give out some water, pray with people, and see what God does, right? That's a great routine. What if we just did that every day, wherever we went? Like, we don't even have to plan it. Lord, I'm on 820. Bless that guy who just cut me off. You know, save him, Lord. He might kill some people, you know? Or just go out, like, Liquor store, I don't know, wherever you go, wherever you do, the the bank. Hey, man, I just want to tell you that God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And he's going to blow your mind if you just trust him. 
What? Would, would you double down on the gospel that much? Church, I'm, again, I'm here to remind you that the harvest is still plentiful. And notice what Jesus does after. In chapter 10, he's like, look, man, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die so that this gospel will come to life, right? But I'm going to do something right now that no other leader is going to do. I'm going to give you what I have, right? And he begins to give them gifts to go do what he did, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to turn this world upside down. And he called his 12 disciples to him. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And here are the 12. And one of them betrayed him. It boggles my mind that Jesus invested so much into Judas. And he still was betrayed. He loved him to the end, even though he would betray him. Notice how the calling, yeah, I mean, you might be like, man, I'm kind of scared. I don't know if I should go. Like, and God's been knocking on your heart to just step out in faith and just trust him, right? You think these disciples weren't scared? Imagine having the power to heal somebody. That's scary. Right? Even preaching up here, you should have seen me. I looked at Mario, I was like, I'm scared, bro. Can you just pray for me right now? Because I, I literally, like, it's, it's a scary thing to handle God's word. It must be held in reverence. And I tell you, sometimes I don't feel adequate. I feel scared. Because there's people's lives that are in the balance right now. Maybe they're listening live or maybe they're here. And they have nowhere else to go. They have no other hope. And we better bring it. We better share with them how much God loves them and how much there is, there is hope and life that is found at the foot of the cross. Notice how the calling came before the equipping. Right? He called the disciples first, and then he gave them the gifts. You think that these guys knew what they were doing? You think that they were all extroverts? Like, yeah, let's go, let's do this. Now we got something to go show the world. Do you think they were secure in their calling? Think about Peter. Just a few days later, denying Jesus to his face. Jesus in his plan, this is what makes Jesus the greatest leader. And again, that's a dumbing down of that, right? Of who he is. Jesus in his plan to populate heaven works through unqualified but willing people who are also moved with compassion when they see a lost and broken generation. Will it be perfect? No. That's a relief, man. That's a relief. We might mess it up. We might mess it up. We, we all make mistakes, but God is still on the throne despite of our mistakes. What will happen if we, just, if we were to just take one step of faith and just to have a conversation with one person and be a laborer just for those 15 minutes? Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God has prepared before him that we should walk in them. See, God has already laid out the work for us. We just have to, we just have to get up. We just have to get up out of our seat and start walking in those good works, right? What will happen, okay, if, you, if you're going to go out and you're going to share the gospel, awesome, you're going to walk in those good works. What happens if you just pray? Jeremiah 33.3, Call to me, he says, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Not only in our going, but in our praying. 
See, there was people that went to battle and there's people that stayed behind. Right? We see that all throughout the Old Testament. But their worth is equal. Because we need a covering of prayer when we go out. We need people to stand in the gap when we're out on mission. And on Wednesdays, when I, I, I have to go to the office and I have to go and sit in a cubicle and talk to people, and I have to go and present the hope that though the, things are falling apart, there's something bigger to live for than just a paycheck. There are many in the valley of decision and distractions today. Many with excuses to not follow Jesus. Many waiting to find the perfect church to join. But the reality is, is that the church is waiting for the day of its perfection. Right? When Jesus comes and says, all right, my bride, you are complete. Now let's go. And guess what? the people looking for a perfect church will miss the wedding day. And my goal in my own personal walk with Jesus is to put more people on the bride side, right? To be part of the bride instead of not a part of the bride. I want to see more of my friends on this side. I want to see more of my family on this side right? So that when Jesus comes, we're just like, hey, there you are, yeah! You see all the people that you talk to, right? Just going up, being raptured. I'm telling you, friends, we're all going to be transferred from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, from sinful to sinless. We're going to be transferred one day. And hopefully, many of the people that we share the gospel, those times where we were laborers, will come with us. Friends, a perfect church will never exist this side of his return. But we can work tirelessly like Paul to be more and more like Jesus, right? Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he says, Not that I have already attained it, or I'm already perfected, right? He's saying, look, dude, I'm never going to be perfect. I'm never going to attain this. But I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Friends, there is, that is such a sobering and powerful thing that you, if you put your trust in Jesus, right? If you've come to the Lord, if you're walking with Jesus, there is a reason why he's apprehended you. There is a reason why he has laid hold of you in your imperfection, in your sinfulness, in all of your mistakes. He has laid hold of you for a specific reason. Brethren, I do not count myself to have, appre to, to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which were behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the upward prize, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's like, look, man, I was apprehended and the things that I used to be a part of, even though God apprehended me and loved me in that, I got to let go of those things because I got a bigger crown to chase. I got a bigger calling to fulfill. We are a work in progress. We are his workmanship, his poema, his masterpiece. And what he has begun, he will perfect. Right? On what day? On the day of his return. Whether it's just for us or for the church as a whole. To me, Jesus is the greatest leader to ever live. Why? Because he not only showed us what to do, he did it. He not only said, hey, go do this. He empowered us. He apprehended us and said, hey, I have a better way to live for you. I have something greater for you to chase. And here it is. Go be a fisher of men. Go be a laborer. Go pray to the Lord of the harvest that more people would be saved. 
Friends, Jesus empowers his people to do, this is what's crazy about him, right? Not only does he save them, he's like, hey, by the way, I know you think like all the stuff I did is kind of cool. John 14, 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, who believes in him? Yeah, all of us? Okay, cool. You believe in him. The works that I do, he said, you will do also. Hmm, interesting. And greater works than these will he do. What does that even mean? It means we are called to find out what exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think actually means. Right? We are called to live a life so sold out for Jesus. That man, everywhere we go, we're just looking for the opportunity. We're chomping at the bit to just share the gospel with somebody. Right? I don't know if you remember when Paul, uh, Pastor Raul taught, and he was talking about the guy who I gave 100 bucks to. The funny thing was, is that $100 wasn't even mine. My mom was like, hey, I want you to have these 100 bucks. You're going to Texas, like, go do something with it. I don't know. And this 100 bucks was like burning a hole in my pocket. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Mom, like, I don't need your money, Mom. Have you ever said that? I said it all the time. And there I am, and there's a guy, this homeless dude. And God's like, hey, that hundred bucks, go give it to him. I'm like, he's probably going to buy beer or some weed or something. You know? That's my, my typical head, right? But reality. Um, and I go, and he's like, I just want to buy bikes so I could get to Oklahoma. His name was Lucky. <laughs> and I still have his picture. He sent, he sent me a picture with his thumbs up and his bike with all of his little trailer. And it was like, welcome to Oklahoma. It's like, that's what I'm talking about, right? Sharing the gospel with people might cost you a few minutes, but it might cure their eternal What would you call that? It would change their destiny, right? It would change their destiny. And every little decision that we make towards Jesus changes our trajectory from glory to glory. Friends, there's a great continuity that we see in the gospel where Jesus transfers his power. It's a distribution of power, right? That's why he said, wait at Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come upon you so that you may be witnesses of all that I've done throughout everywhere, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? And what did they do? They waited, and they were there, and they were empowered, and they went out, and they were witnesses. Friends, if we believe in these words, the continuity is an action, right? It's not just words anymore. They're imperatives sometimes. It's not just words anymore. They're, it's God prompting us to be laborers and fill a need that nobody else is filling, just like he did. There's no other Savior like Jesus. There's no one else that came and lived a perfect and sinless life to die for broken people. And he filled a need that no one else could fill. We have a God parading himself right now who is a capricious God, who changes his mind, who's all about death instead of life. And it makes Jesus that much more attractive. And we need to be heralds of light in this dark world. We need to see a lost and broken generation and say there is a plentiful harvest ahead of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a good God, that you're a saving God, 
that you're a God who loves endlessly. You're a long-suffering God, a merciful God. A God who removes sin as far as the east is from the west. And God, maybe tonight there are some who have been just wanting to be a laborer but don't feel equipped. Maybe they feel inadequate. Maybe they don't feel qualified. Father, would you just encourage them tonight to take one step of faith and take you for your word. For those that are listening that might not know who you are, God, we know you can save. To the uttermost, pull out of the miry clay those who are dying and perishing. Father, send laborers into their lives. We pray now, God, for more laborers to see this generation not as a lost cause, but a plentiful harvest. Lord, would you fill the seats of Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches in this area and throughout the world? Would you make your hope louder Would that people see Jesus through us? Father, help us. Help us be good stewards of the time and the gifting that you've given us. In your name we pray, God. Amen. Hope you're encouraged, church. Love you guys so much. Church, if you need prayer, there'll be people up here to pray for you. Let's sing. the rest of your week. We'll see you on Sunday.